Good morning. Welcome to Blooming Glen Mennonite Church. Whether you are here in person, watching the live stream on YouTube, or watching a replay later, you are welcome here. If you are a visitor, welcome. We hope you find our service meaningful and that you find connection here, either through the words shared, the music, or the people. We gather here to worship this morning with all of the challenges going on in our life, around the country, and world. We come, to, we come together as one body to worship you. For our, our call to worship this morning, I'm going to read the words from Psalm 121. This comes from the Voices Together Worship Leader Edition, number 79. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God will not let, not let your foot slip. Your keeper will not slumber. The one who watches over Israel will never slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. God will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forever. 355, 355. Six hundred forty. My shepherd will supply my needs. Six hundred forty.
and number 515. Following this hymn, children up to grades five or over may come forward and have a seat up on the top platform, 515. <laughs> you can come sit up here if you want, wherever. <laughs> Eight. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you all here. Um, do you know what this is? What is it? Money. <laughs> it is money, exactly. And I know you guys love to run out there, collect money, and bring it all back, right? Yeah. But do you know why we collect this money? Why? Why? Can you read this here? I Can you read this? What letter? M-C-C. -C. Right, we collect the money for M-C-C, which is Mennonite Central Committee. Do you guys know what that is? No, I had to look up a lot last night too, but they do a lot. They help people when they don't have enough food, when they don't have enough clothing. Mm -hmm. You mean like, um, it's like um, a poor box, like you put money in it for the poor? A little bit, like we put money in and then they take that money and they give it to parents so they can buy food for their kids, so they can get school supplies, so you can go to school. And then the children have enough food to eat. Um, and then something else they also do is they help, they go out and help people make peace. And that's what I wanted to talk about today because Mike Ford, our pastor, he's gonna be talking about being a peacemaker. So do you guys, what is a peacemaker? Um, it's someone who makes peace for the world. That's right, and how can you do that? What's one way you can make peace? You can help others. Mm-hmm, help and others. You can also do this. Like be quiet and listen? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any other ideas? Those are great ideas, and let's be nice, smile at people, listen to what they have to say. And another way, because I love music, is harmony. I think it's about making harmony. Because when Jesus came, I think he came to make harmony between us and God, so we can be in harmony with God, and to make harmony with other people, so we can be in harmony. Hmm? <laughs> That's great. So if you think of harmony, what do you think about? Singing. And I like, and I like to sing about things that we can do. You like to sing about things we can do. What else do you think of with harmony? 
But I think of the congregation singing. I think of the choir when we all sing together, right? And some of you sing in choir, some of you sing at home. Mm -hmm. And so when everyone sings together, we all sing d the same text normally or more or less, but we might sing different notes. There might be a violin, there might be a piano, and then everyone finds it, but it's still beautiful, right? Everyone's doing something different, but it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, to me, that's when it sounds beautiful together, that's harmony. And that's kind of a picture of what God wants us to do. And that's why we collect coins, so that we can send people out into the world and show people, to tell people about Jesus and show them what it means. That's why it says, my coins count. Exactly, my coins count. Um, and everybody's coins count. <laughs> um, so while we can't go, um, well, we can't go, I do have coins here, so each of you can grab a bag and put some coins in. And remember that your coins count and that when you go out, you can make peace and you can help other people make peace. So if you wanna grab a box and then you can put it in if you want. And then I have a coloring sheet for you. And to everyone, please feel free to put your coins in the boxes or bills or checks. <laughs> We're at all the emphasis at the exits. exits. Well, a couple of things to mention before we get into the sermon today. First of all, uh, you may have seen it in Alpin and Glenn News, um, but for the past many years, we've put birthdays and anniversary dates of the church family in the newsletter, but we've realized too that at times we've inadvertently caused confusion or pain with omissions or inclusions. So we're gonna just put a, a one every month, just a happy birthday to all this month without details, reminding you that your directory as everyone's birthday. So for those who use those announcements to send cards or remembrance to people, please use our directory for that information. And uh, thanks for celebrating special dates with everyone. The other reminder is, is uh, just we are moving again towards outdoor worship soon. And uh, the 16th will be, um, our plan is to have a baptism service at Cole Park, and then the 23rd of May, we'll be out on the pavilion beginning um, our, a series of summer worship services out there. Until that time that we're outside with a little more distancing and freedom um, in the open field, please wear our masks inside. And I rejoice that many of you have gotten vaccinated and there's much more safety. And yet, remember there are people that are fighting cancer or who are immunocompromised and they want to feel like they have a safe place here. And for them, part of that is, is those of us wearing masks to keep them safe, so please, while we're inside this building. Let's uh, use our masks. Um, this is the third sermon of the Beatitudes series and the final one. And um, we're looking again at, at three verses in Matthew 5. Uh, the beginning of chapters 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount, that famous teaching from Jesus. And we're gonna finish today with, with the final three Beatitudes. Next Sunday, during Sunday school, for any interested, I'll be teaching uh, a forum here on the Beatitudes with some more specific practices, things to experiment with to walk out the teachings of the Beatitudes. And that's open to any age, and we'll do that about 10 minutes after uh, the worship service is done here in the sanctuary. And we will be able to live stream that for, for those who need to, to see it at home. Also encourage you to, to come next Sunday if you can, because Dan Emer will be speaking uh, as our preacher next Sunday. Dan is the director of Worthwhile Wear, a local organization that, that uh, works against sex trafficking, and Dan's got some things to share with us there. 
So please pray with me as we dig into today's scripture. Lord God, you have said much in these Beatitudes to us in uh, the last two weeks and today. And so God, I just pray for all of us that you teach us how to walk out being poor in spirit and lamenting and being humble and how to pursue justice and peacemaking and extend mercy and to be pure in heart and also be willing to be persecuted and treated poorly for the gospel. So Lord, give us understanding today as we look at these final three Beatitudes that we would see more ways to walk at the way of Jesus in our lives and in our culture. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I just have reminded you each time that we've looked at these that, that again, these are hard teachings, but they're not just like lofty ideas, theology to try if you can. Jesus really meant these are things you should live out. These are the way of Jesus that we are to act and, and live in our society. And we could reorder our entire lives around the Beatitudes and do a great job of, of living out the way of Jesus. The Beatitudes really show how humanity can be rightly ordered if we live them out. I think of them as expressions of spirit-filled kingdom life, that it's our responsibility to reveal to society. Another thing when we read the Beatitudes is to remember that Jesus was really speaking not just to us individually, that you'll be blessed if you do these things, but he was speaking to us as community. He was saying that, Christians, if you do these things, blessing will come through and in your community because these things affect other people. When we learn how to be peacemakers or to extend mercy and compassion, it has an effect much bigger than just our individual blessing. So with that in mind, let's look at the final three Beatitudes uh, today. Starting with verse nine in Matthew five. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We'll spend most of our time today looking at, at this verse, blessed are the peacemakers. The idea of peace permeates the biblical record. The Greek word for peace is arene, and it refers to the health or the welfare of an individual, that they be at rest, that they be whole, that they have harmonious relationship with God, with neighbors, with community. Consider the attention that Isaiah pays to it in the verse Isaiah chapter 52, verse seven. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. The most common Jewish greeting is shalom. And in Hebrew, the word shalom suggests the absence of war, it suggests the possibility of wholeness, harmony, prosperity for all. When you say shalom to someone, you're saying, I wish upon you and through you that the world is as it should be. So when you greet someone with a shalom, it's, it's not only a hello goodbye, but it's saying peace, harmony, wholeness, may it come through us and in our relationship to the world. Simply put, a peacemaker is one who wants to bring harmony and tranquility in relationship to the world. It's not just about keeping peace. You can keep the peace by doing very little. We can keep things peaceful by keeping our mouths shut and not saying things when we should. We keep peace by withdrawing and laying low, by not getting involved. But this is peacemaking and we're not excused from it. This is saying, that I wanna follow the way of Jesus and be someone who initiates peace. So being a peacemaker means that we're actively seeking peace and accord in relationships with other people, that we're actively reaching beyond differences to connect. Well, this is hard work. <laughs> we all have people that we don't get along with, with whom we disagree, with whom our perspectives are at opposite ends of the scale. And how am I supposed to live in harmony with people that I detest or that I just can't get along with? How am I supposed to make harmony with someone who I hate or who hates me. 
Well, I really like the analogy Robin gave of, of harmony. I think that's a good way to think of it. And so a modest proposal for us, just at least as Christians, <laughs> let's try to make harmony. We're not all gonna be the same. We're not all gonna sing the same parts or the same ways. We don't all have the same voice, but together, peacemaking is learning to make harmony. It's learning to seek unity in the midst of diversity. It is not sameness, but it is being together in diversity. We're a diverse congregation. The least we can do is commit to making peace, building bridges, establishing harmony with those with whom we differ. Well, secondly, I think it's also incumbent upon us to do our best to make peace, especially with those that we differ from. And I just think back to what God said in Genesis, that all humankind is created in the image of God. And when we think that everyone bears God's image, the least we can do is to think, how do I honor the God image in the other? How do I at least give them dignity and respect because they are created in God's image? I think that's where peacemaking can start. Of course, you're a peacemaker when you feel empathy or compassion for another, when you care about people. Central to all peacemaking is having compassion for the other. So I'm gonna introduce an exercise, and then Beth Gosha is gonna tell us a story to illustrate how she has made peace in her life in a situation, and then we'll come back and finish the example. Excuse me. <coughs> Think about somebody that gives you an ug in your stomach. It's probably someone that like, when you think of being with them, you're like, ugh. Either because you, know, you don't like their personality or they've hurt you maybe, or there's a, a, a chasm between you. Just think about that person. You know, it can be any number of reasons that you get a, a tight pit in your stomach when you think of them. Again, maybe you lost a friendship with them. Maybe there's something that's unforgiven or broken between you. Maybe you just don't like them. Or that they take up a lot of time and energy or maybe you've had a fight with somebody, but think of someone that just gives you that uh, in your stomach and keep that person in mind. We'll come back to them in a minute, but if you would give an ear to Beth now, she's got a neat life story that demonstrates how to make peace. Thanks, Mike. I don't know if I've ever thought of this as a neat life story, <laughs> but it is part of my life story. So I have a portion, um, a, a story about forgiving my maternal grandparents for something that happened when I was very young. And in the sake of time and trying to keep my emotions in check, I have written it down so that I stay on point. My mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer when I was 13. She was given six months to live. My sister and I were staying with our grandparents, waiting for mom to get well enough to come to Florida for her last bit of time. Unfortunately, she did not get better, and it was hard for my sister and I to watch her slowly die. We were going to the hospital two times a day, and it was just too much. We told our grandparents that we only wanted to go with them once a day, as it was hard to watch mom suffer. To make a long story short, they told us that while we were staying at their house, we could follow their rules or we could leave. So we left. Since we had previously lived in Maine, we had family friends who took us in. And since we knew our grandparents' schedule, we went to the hospital when my grandparents weren't there. About a week later, the doctor called to say that mom had a fever, and if it went up at all, she would die. That was the first day we didn't go, and the day she died. My dad came up to Maine, and we went to the funeral. My grandparents were greeting people as they arrived, and it was a church that you had to walk up steps to get to the entrance except for us. As we walked up the steps to the church, they turned around and went in, never said hello, never said goodbye. After the service ended, we got up and walked out of the church, and again, no interaction. That was the last time I saw my grandparents, and we never had a relationship with them after my mom died, and we were their only grandchildren as well. So I was mad for a long time. My grandparents were really the only people who my sister and I had gone to church with. And to be honest, if that's what a Christian meant, I didn't want any part of it. That lasted almost 20 years. Blooming Glen was a big part of my healing process. I was a two-timer in the adult membership class. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to fully process my faith journey without pushing me to baptism, which I really wanted somebody to just tell me it was okay to do it. 
So the second time around, I was encouraged to write a letter to my grandparents. So I did, and I'm going to read a portion of that to you because I've learned along the way to make copies of things. So this is a copy of the letter that I wrote to my grandparents, and it's dated December 19th, 2001. So of course I say, Dear Julia and John, I don't know if this letter will reach you or not, but I have the need to write to you after all these years. It's been over 18 years since Mom died, and, I have, and a lot of good things have happened in my life. But one area where I still struggle is my faith journey. I believe a lot of these obstacles in my faith comes from mom's, come from mom's death and what happened between me and you, my grandparents. You were the only people who had ever taken Amy and I to church, and I appreciate that you did that for us. But then mom died, and you threw us out of your house and ultimately out of your lives. Especially now that I am a mother myself, I will probably not never understand why you did what you did. Even if you did hate, do hate my dad that much, we were still the only loving, living thing you had left from mom. But after all of these years of feeling anger and hurt and confusion over the whole thing, I want to let it go. I don't want it to interfere with my spiritual journey anymore. I don't want to hold God responsible for your actions. And I don't want to feel anger towards you anymore. So I want you to know that I forgive you for how you treated me when mom died. I'm going to have to believe that you did what you did because she was your daughter, and now I know what a strong bond that is. The truth is, after all these years, I really don't even know you anymore, and I'm sorry that you have not been a part of our lives. Believe it or not, we turned out pretty good. And then I give all kinds of you know, great things that Amy and I have done that they've missed out on. I miss my mom more than you will ever know. I know she is proud of both Amy and I because we've done well, even though we've been through a lot. I hope you have been able to forgive us for whatever we did to make you not want us in your lives. So I held on to anger and resentment for almost for 18 years. And do you know who suffered the most from that? Me. I bet they didn't think about me for 18 years. Finding a way to offer forgiveness and make peace for something you've experienced is hard work, but it's worth it. And it's not about forgetting. I will never forget what happened, but I did forgive. Thanks, Beth, and thanks for your vulnerability. And I, by saying neat, yes, uh, that's a misnomer. What I think is beautiful is that you have found forgiveness and, and, and made peace in the midst of that pain. <clears throat> if you'll just do this with me, where you sit, Hold out one hand like this, just hold it in front of you. And this hand represents you. And now think of, of that person or situation with the other hand that gives you that ug in your stomach or the something that hasn't been made right. And the image on the screen is what happens. If you put your hands together, you think of those interlocking fingers. That's the striving that you're seeking for to make peace. You're finding a way to put this together. You can take your hands down. I think as we think about making peace, here are some questions to ask ourselves. Just when you look at relationships, what helps me connect with people? What helps me right a wrong or build a bridge over something that's been broken? Is it an honest talk, an apology, a letter like Beth wrote? Is it an offer of forgiveness to someone? Is it a phone call? The point is, to make peace, we have to find ways to reach across the brokenness or the chasm that's between us. What can I do to build that bridge? Romans, 8, or Romans 12, 18 sums it up well. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. When you're trying to make peace, it won't always succeed in getting a reciprocal uh, offer from the other person, but at least whatever you can do, to make peace. That's what we're called to do. So let's not let differences with others define relationship. Let's not differences become toxic or separate us. Perhaps each of us needs to give up the need to always be right. Perhaps we need to be better listeners. We need to have more humility and curiosity about other people. The second part of this beatitude, it says that Blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called children of God. 
In contrast to the world where people conquer other people by dominance or violence or establish systems of military rule or political power, Jesus is saying when you make peace, we become family. You're like sons and daughters to me when you are peacemakers. You don't have to strive to be in charge or to be supreme. Peacemaking leads us to be family, to be one household, and to be committed in kinship with each other. So let us all strive to be peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Well, the last two verses in the Beatitudes move from blessings that seem more doable or desirable to being persecuted. And in this eighth beatitude, Jesus is offering comfort to those who have suffered unjust persecution. Now, if you're a foolish or an immoral person, you might deserve oppression or persecution. But here, these people are being persecuted for being righteous, for taking a stand, for behaving like God. It would seem that they least deserve persecution. Well, Bible commentators suggest that in this part of the Beatitudes, in verse 8, Jesus is likely criticizing the religious leaders of his day. In the day, the time of Jesus, religious leaders were known for persecuting people that didn't adopt their specific brand of righteousness, didn't follow all the rules that they taught. And Jesus is likely saying that those of you who are earnestly being like God, who are quietly, consistently being righteous, yet you're being harassed and intimidated and oppressed by inflexible, dictatorial, spiritual leaders, well, guess what? You're blessed. You're doing the right thing. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if someone is, is verbally abusing you or mistreating you or you're being punished because you're living righteously, you're honoring God with your behavior, Jesus is saying it may be hard. In fact, it will be difficult for you. But your reward far away is the hazard because God's kingdom belongs to you. When you're persecuted for following God, Jesus is saying the blessing is that you're enacting the kingdom of God on earth. You may have to suffer for being a righteous person, but your actions are pleasing to God and bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. And then the final verse that we'll look at. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now Jesus is switching his focus from verse 8 where he's criticizing the hypocritical religious rulers who persecute people, and now he's teaching his disciples more. Remember, when Matthew 5 began, Jesus was originally going up on this mountain to teach his disciples, and the crowds just kept following him, and they decided to teach them too. But he's probably looking back at his 12 disciples right now, and he's saying, this good news that I'm preaching and I'm asking you to also teach, it's not going to be liked by the current religious establishment. In fact, those in power will probably persecute you for teaching what I'm teaching you. They'll utter evil against you because you're challenging their system, their power. So the harassment that his disciples would receive was because of following Jesus. And Jesus was also prophesying the persecution and death that he would suffer. And he's just letting his disciples know, it's going to be rough when you follow me and teach the things I teach to you. Well, when you tell a disciple that, I'm thinking, you know, as a leader, that's probably not the best way to motivate someone and say, hey, do these things that I'm teaching you and it's going to be really hard for you. You're going to be tortured. You're going to be thrown in prison. You're going to get beat up. You're going to be called names and kicked out of places. But your reward is that you're advancing the kingdom of heaven on earth. And Jesus was also reminding the disciples that even if you die for this cause, great is your reward in heaven. You'll be with me forever. This message was really important to the early church. Again, they were heavily persecuted as they spread the gospel. Of the 12 apostles, um, either legend or, or fact says that at least 10 of them died as martyrs. They were stabbed, beheaded, imprisoned, stoned, all because they followed Jesus. What a, the picture on the screen is, is a woodcut from Dirk Willems, one of our Mennonite ancestors. And back in the 1500s, when the early Anabaptists were starting the church, they were terribly persecuted for taking a stand to be Jesus' followers. 
Hundreds and thousands were put to death for things like believer's baptism or refusing to join the military. In the case of Dirk Willems, it's a familiar story that if you've looked at any minute in history, you're probably aware. Willems was from the Netherlands. He had been rebaptized as a young man and he rejected the infant baptism that was being practiced at that time. He wanted to show his devotion to his new faith and it got him in trouble. He was put in prison and in his prison room, he was able to make a rope out of used rags and tie together a rope that he climbed out of the prison onto a frozen moat. And a prison guard noticed him escaping. And Dirk, because he'd lost so much weight in prison, could run across the ice and didn't fall through. But the prison guard was much heavier and ended up crashing through the ice, started calling for help. Dirk turned around, went back, and rescued the guard. And then they put him back in prison. And eventually, he was burned at the stake. That is making peace at all costs. Another Anabaptist forebear would be Pilgrim Marpeck. And I want to read something from uh, his writings. Pilgrim Marpeck explained his priorities this way. Our highest joy shall be that in heaven our names are written in the book of life to show with unwavering faith and certain hope, love toward the neighbor, and thus prove our love of God, is and shall be our highest joy. Not the work, but love itself, to serve and to be a guardian of the salvation of all the elect of God is heavenly joy. Here again, Pilgrim Marpeck and other early, Baptists, early Anabaptists were willing to put loss of life ahead of, of living on earth for the sake of following Jesus, of spreading his love, of making peace with their fellow humans. They knew how to have joy and choose it in the midst of being persecuted. Well, as I close this teaching on the Beatitudes, I remind us that we are most fortunate. None of us face prison or torture or death because we claim Jesus as Lord and Savior. Yet when we do face any ridicule or bias or insult because we are Christians. Take heart, persevere. Remember that our reward is great. We bring heaven on earth when we follow the way of Jesus. In closing, as we look back over these Beatitudes, you know, I suggested that we are to follow them and live them out. Is it easy? No, it is not. Is it our natural bent to act in these ways? Typically, no. We have to work hard and intentionally to be like Jesus. It's hard to be humble rather than proud. It's a challenge to show mercy and compassion rather than being judgmental or distancing ourselves from others. It's hard to make peace and build bridges of understanding, especially when we don't like the other person. But here's the simple question at the foundation of all of this. Do we want to be like Jesus? Do we want to live out the way of Jesus? Do we want our daily words and actions to imitate the teachings of Jesus? If in any small way you say yes to that, then hallelujah. We have much work together to do to grow and mature, and yet we have these nine principles in Matthew 5, 1 through 11, that we can work on living out. If, if all the Beatitudes are too hard to live out, at least pick one or two. You know, decide that I can be more compassionate. Decide that I can take initiative to make peace. Decide that I can be pure in heart or humble. If you even just pick one or two and walk it out, you will be yourself becoming more like Jesus and you'll be helping the kingdom of God be evident on the earth. Join me in prayer. Lord God, thank you for what you show us in Beatitudes and thank you for giving us these examples of the way of Jesus to walk out. I pray that by your spirit, you will just speak to each of our hearts. Lord, if there's one or two Beatitudes that we can just really work on, you know, make it a goal for a week and then two weeks and a month that we can really walk it out in our lives and just expand the way of Jesus. And I do pray that personal blessing comes, but more than that, that your blessing comes through us to the world, that as we walk these things out, the kingdom of God is enacted on earth. Give us strength and leading as we do this in Jesus' name. Amen.
578, 578, 578. We often know peace by its opposite discord or harmony by its opposite discord. The Psalm 121 on the front cover and the image of the ascending Christ, I think, is an ultimate vision or image of the Beatitude Sermon and finding the ultimate satisfaction and blessing that may not come fully in this time, but at another time. The desire to live with the power and work of this coming together. This is uh, an African piece that we have not sung for quite some time, and our verses will be the English, and the first two verses I will do the call and you simply echo. So I'll give you an E-flat, please. Oh, 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 if I sing, blessed are the persecuted for Jesus Christ is living within them. You sing the same thing, but we need a little percussion to go. Those of you who are comfortable, just a little something on. One. Or a foot. Or a gentle. One. And any subdivision of that. Don't stop. Blessed are the persecuted for Jesus Christ is living within them. Blessed are the persecuted for Jesus Christ is living within them. Great will be their reward. They shall be given a crown when the Lord comes from heaven to meet them. Great will be their reward. They shall be given a crown when the Lord comes from heaven to meet them. Blessed are they who are hungry in spirit, for the Lord lives within them. Blessed are they who are hungry in spirit, for the Lord lives within them. Great will be their reward, they shall be given a crown when the Lord comes from heaven to meet them. Great will be their reward, they shall be given a crown when the Lord comes from heaven to meet them. Now we're gonna sing everything together. Blessed are the pure in heart. And die. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for Jesus Christ is living. Say it again. Blessed are the pure in heart, for Jesus Christ is living. Great. Great will be their reward. They shall be given a crown when the Lord comes from man to meet again. Great will be their reward. They shall be given a crown when the Lord comes from man to meet them. Last verse. Blessed are they who are thirsty in spirit, for the Lord lives within again. Blessed are they who are thirsty in spirit, for the Lord lives great will. Great will be their reward. They shall be given a crown, for the Lord comes from them again now. Great will be their reward. They shall be given a crown, for the Lord comes. Come them up once again, great will be their reward. They shall be given a crown when the Lord comes from heaven to meet them. Before we pray, I asked Katie Gaiman if I could give an update on Cassidy, and here is what she said. We go inpatient on Monday for Cassidy's last planned admission. Please pray for another smooth, smooth round of immunotherapy so that we can hopefully be discharged on Friday like last time. Please also pray for all of us and the mixed emotions that come with the end of treatment. 
We are obviously so excited and relieved to be here, but it's also sad to say goodbye to people we love but hope to never see again. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we say a special thanks to the Blooming Glen Mennonite Church community. We have really appreciated the prayers and support from so many people there. Thank you. You can visit Cassidy's Caring Bridge website if you'd like more details. Okay, please join me in prayer. Lord, we are grateful to be in your house, to see people we haven't seen in a while, to freely gather and worship and praise you. What a blessing that is. We lift the following people to you. Dorothy Dayton, Jean Detweiler, Ruth Detweiler, Cassidy Gaiman, and Dave Landis. You know their needs. You know the needs of their families and caregivers. Mother's Day is next weekend. While that is a day of celebration for those who have experienced loss of their mother or have a, uh, oh, geez, a broken relationship with their mothers or perhaps have experienced um, infertility issues, it can also be a day that's bittersweet. We lift those people up to you. We also pray for all caregivers, health care workers, teachers, and essential employees, families that are still navigating working and learning from home. We pray for healing and unity around the world. We think of the recent surge in India. All of us, every single one of us, has been affected by this pandemic. We ask for your help with our spiritual, physical, and mental needs. We pray for our church and our community. Guide us, Lord, and provide a path so that Blooming Glen can continue to serve the needs of our members and those around us. <clears throat> We lift up the silent prayers that are in the minds of those listening to this prayer, things that are not shared, heavy burdens that need your loving arms. Help lift the load of those that need your love. We pray all of these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. I must have sucked in all the pollen on my way to church this morning. There's a couple of announcements. I'm going to read one, and then Bob Bishop is going to come up to give an announcement. <clears throat> the first is that Sunday, May 16th, worship service will be held at 10 a.m. at Culp Memorial Park on 2nd Street in Perkesee. You are invited to bring lawn chairs and blankets to sit on. Some chairs will be provided. This service will include baptisms, and this is a great opportunity to invite friends and neighbors to join us for worship. Last Sunday, the youngest trustee and my good friend Isaiah Denlinger stood here and had an appeal for workday for yesterday. And today it's probably fitting that the oldest trustee would stand here to give a response and a report of what actually took place. We were blessed with the most glorious weather and with safety yesterday. And to observe and to learn what all took place would take an hour to start at the cemetery, the columbarium, walk around this facility and see the landscaping that was done. It would include walking the trails. It would include uh, the pavilion. A lot of work was done at the pavilion, at the farmhouse, and the house adjacent to Blooming Glen Road as well. You might even have to ride a bucket truck uh, with Will Berge to see what was done up by the steeple. Some have asked about attendance. It's as hard to estimate how many people will come as it is to count how many people are here. If you've ever been in a barn or even a house that's crawling with cats, you stand there and you think you have a number and they keep coming. That's the way workday is. It's hard to nail the number down because there's people that are involved before workday, after workday, and coming and going the whole time. So, <clears throat> but I would safely say that there was between 40 and 50 people that were part participated in one way or another. Um, the trustees were especially grateful for the uh, first timers that were here yesterday. 
and the number of young men and women that participated. Workday, I believe, is one of our finest examples of living in community and in the, uh, it's an Anabaptist value. It doesn't matter whether we're right or left of center. It doesn't matter whether we're pro or antihistamine. Often it, the most important work is relational and yesterday was no exception. Mark your calendar for October 2, the first Saturday in October, fall work day. Thank you. Before we pray for the offering, a reminder that the offering containers are located at the front exits to the sanctuary and the back center exit. Let's pray. Lord, we ask for your help to guide us so that we may be your hands and feet. We are thankful for the offering that is being received today and dedicate it to furthering your kingdom here in our church and community. In your name we pray. Amen. work of the Spirit that provides the foundational possibility that we can have the peace of the earth and the peace of the rivers here and now. 592, I invite you to stand for how firm a foundation. 592, how firm a foundation. One, two, three, and five. Verse one in parts, verse five in parts, and the other two verses will sing back and forth. Oh, in part, how firm a foundation you say of the Lord in the
I remind you that there are Sunday schools uh, that are reforming, and if you've been part of one, it's good to check with your leadership. If you'd like to attend one that you know, know where to go, I'll be up front here and be glad to advise you. Denny Gross, our, one of our elders, will be in the back lobby to pray for anybody, and I'd be glad to pray for you too if you have a need. And so, as a benediction, so far as it depends on us, let us be at peace with all people. In God's name, amen. Be dismissed.